Okay, I think we should start. There might be a few more people uh, uh, popping in uh, this uh, session, uh, but we have to keep a bit on the schedule because we are uh, together until uh, half past 3 uh, p.m. and uh, we have quite a lot of things to uh, go through and to do together. Um, I'm Maxim Forrest. I'm uh, your trainer for uh, this uh, for this session, uh, this introductory session on integrating the sex and gender dimensions in research. Um, I'm here uh, on behalf of Yellow Window. It's a consultancy agency, uh, very much focused on advancing gender equality and the gender dimension in research and the academia. Although we are doing also. Uh, also other things, uh, some uh, applied research, uh, especially in the field of gender equality. Uh, I'm also gender scholars and, and professors at uh, Sciences Po University uh, in Paris, also very much focusing on uh, gender equality policies, but this is my practical side that will be mobilized today uh, rather than the theoretical one. Um, this uh, session is uh, a joint session, which is pretty unusual for Gender Equality Academy. You can see it here on the presentation. Um, it is co-organized uh, with uh, the EU-funded Gender Smart project, um, and about which I will tell you a little bit more. Let's start with the uh, Gender Equality Academy program for those who are not familiar uh, with it yet. Um, it's a EU-funded initiative. Uh, which is uh, aimed first at developing and implementing um, an, a consistent high quality capacity building program devoted specifically to gender equality in research and innovation. Uh, of course, it is meant to be um, uh, based on state of the art knowledge and expertise, mobilizing uh, people who uh, know about the field and who have been engaged with training people in this area for uh, quite a while now or whom are being transferred this knowledge uh, through uh, their own train, uh, training of trainer activities. Um, we aim also to provide you with a tailor-made training material uh, for uh, specific uh, topics. And we target different groups, decision makers, uh, people involved in human resource management, gender equality and diversity officers at universities and research centers, uh, senior and uh, less senior researchers, uh, especially those who are involved in, uh, in uh, project teams, and so on and so on. I would just kindly ask uh, all participants to mute themselves so that we don't have background noise uh, until you, you take the floor at some point uh, in the, later in the session. Thank you. Um, we are uh, use different formats. Of course, those formats have uh, been a little bit affected by the current pandemic situation. So we had to, uh, to be reactive and uh, to adapt, uh, but we still do provide uh, quite a number of formats, although uh, currently everything is obviously online. So uh, we have uh, theoretically in-person training, but those have been of course suspended and online trainings, which are uh, de being delivered from speed. Uh, online workshops, webinars, summer schools also planned online for the next summer, um, and uh, DOCC, DOCC being, um, let's say, the um, progressive and feminist equivalent of a MOOC. So it's a distributive online cooperative, collaborative course uh, where uh, um, the different type of knowledge are put and pulled together uh, and with a huge um, interactional uh, um, dimension. And this is what we actually do through Gender Equality Academy uh, and quite successfully so far. And about the Gender Smart Project, so it's a project which is, as many others currently funded by the European Commission, devoted to implementing changes for gender equality uh, through the uh, design and implementation of gender equality plans, so JEPs at a five research performing organizations, so research center or universities, and one research funding organization, the largest uh, French funding organization, the National Agency for Research. The focus of Gender Smart is uh, rather on life sciences, on agriculture, on agriculture for international development as well. And this will be a bit reflected in today's session, although it might not be your own field, but that's actually not um, the main purpose of the case studies uh, that we will use this afternoon to be really focused on your own research area. 
the very purpose is to demonstrate how you can integrate a gender dimension in research and actually working on fields which are not yours uh, uh, is also useful. Um, and and uh, there will be also focus on uh, STEMs, on uh, um, new technologies and so on. Uh, so this is a typical organization of a project like uh, Gender Smart. I won't spend much time on it. It's about work deliverables and all that stuff. But the idea is that every single participating organization is delivering a gender equality plan, uh, which is covering a variety of issues from uh, work-life balance through promoting a gender equality culture and integrating the gender dimension in research uh, content itself, which is our very topic uh, today. A quick look to our agenda before um, we, uh, we start talking about your expectation for today's session. Um, so we, uh, we have like a small, uh, quite short uh, modules uh, coming one after the other. Until the morning break, we will be uh, mostly, um, I will be mostly delivering some information to you like data, uh, going through the different uh, gender imbalances and bias that exist in research and the academia. So that you get the full picture of it, that you actually realize what we are together today, um, that there are problems that need to be fixed, that those are related to unconscious biases and uh, other type of gender biases that also need to be addressed. And uh, from the break uh, this morning, we will start reflecting upon your own research areas and uh, the full life cycle of a research project, for instance, and, uh, and uh, of a research team as well. And, uh, and we will check, uh, especially this afternoon, how we can do practically to integrate this gender perspective. So this is meant to be an introductory session. So uh, we cannot get much into the detail, neither on the theoretical part, nor on the practical one. But uh, the idea is that you get the full picture, that you understand what can be actually done, and that you have a glimpse on what uh, is to be done, actually, in practical terms. Okay, so I would like now, um, you, you, most of you filled in um, a very extensive Exente questionnaire that some may include, uh, uh, also find a little bit invasive. We're working on that. Uh, but taking, about, uh, taking um, aside what you have answered in this, uh, in this uh, um, questionnaire, I would like uh, you to note down in the chat box so that you can find down your screen uh, with a little bubble. Um, you can write down your main expectation, just one, that can be either positive or negative, doesn't matter, for this workshop. What you expect to take away uh, from it, to take home uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, by the, the end of the afternoon uh, following this session. What is your main need or expectation for it? So just like take a couple of minutes to think about it and to share it uh, via the chat box. And I will quickly review it and check whether we are aligned in terms of expectation and content to avoid any, uh, 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 any uh, disappointment from your side. Okay, so please use the chat box and I will start reviewing what you are posting there. You have a few minutes to do it. And no problem for the typos, okay? We will be very, uh, very tolerant with any typos that our chat box works. Better to work quickly than properly. Okay, I see quite a lot of uh, contribution already. So I will share uh, a few uh, with you uh, at Cloud. Um, so how to integrate gender issues in my own research project. So that's definitely uh, one of the purpose. What are the main steps to implement, to implement this gender dimension? Uh, um, possibly using a bottom-up approach. Uh, so uh, we will see what we mean here by, by bottom-up. Um, improve uh, understanding of how the tools and methods uh, allowing to integrate the gender uh, dimension into research are working. Learn also from Margrethe uh, how this uh, issue can be approached for uh, interna internal mobilization purpose as well. I guess that it is how it is to be, it can be communicated to, uh, to researchers, for instance. So that's more a meta 
uh, meta expectation. That's not about how to, to do it in practice, but how to look how it can be done and communicate about it. How to make a, um, a research better uh, workplace for me and my colleagues. Actually, this Eva we will touch, but only incidentally, uh, by providing the uh, big picture of uh, the status quo of gender balances, imbalances in uh, research in the academia. That will give you some hints to do that. But our very uh, focus today in how to integrate the gender dimension um, in research projects, which includes a part about a human resource, about how the research team is working. So that corresponds to your expectation, but with a stronger focus on the gender dimension in research content, knowledge production. So uh, that will be covered, but only partly because it is a focus of many other trainings by Gender Equality Academy. Uh, the same for INMA, uh, how to improve gender imbalances uh, and to hear successful stories. This is something we actually deliver through other training formats when we focus, for instance, on recruitment, on career uh, uh, appraisal, uh, on promotion and so on, uh, which is something that we uh, do not mainly cover here. Uh, we just like go through the main imbalances to get the broader picture, but we get uh, quickly to the knowledge production dimension. Uh, Ute, yes, definitely. Uh, this is what we will be uh, cover, covering. Okay, so what I see here is that uh, like 80% of uh, your expectations are really aligned with what we're going to do. So hopefully that will meet your expectation. There is a big chance of it at least. Uh, I just see maybe a few expectations which are more related to uh, um, correcting imbalances in the academia, uh, um, like learning about good practices, for instance, in recruitment or in access to decision making or in institutional communication. This is not the core, uh, the core of this uh, of this uh, training. Uh, this is something we touch upon uh, a lot through different training format. Um, and here really we focused on knowledge production settings. So a research team delivering a research project uh, and how this can uh, address the gender dimension on different level, including on the functioning of the team itself. So it can provide uh, incidentally some insight for you as well. And how to do intersectional research that's not either uh, the, the, the focus. Uh, we will talk a little bit about intersectionality in the, uh, in the introduction. And this is something that you can bring yourself and that we can actually discuss through the case studies uh, because there might be intersectional way to uh, integrate the gender dimension, to do some gender plus by referring to other streams of inequalities or discrimination. Uh, so this is something that we can actually address um, uh, but not through the content presented, but rather through the case studies that will um, take quite a lot of our time today. So that might be done, although that's not the core focus of this training. Okay, okay, so that gives a pretty clear picture to me. Um, so thank you. We will uh, stay uh, 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 to, to, to follow up uh, according to the schedule. Thank you for sharing your expectations. I don't see many trouble here, and I hope that you will uh, enjoy the content. Um, to start with, um, we need a few definitions, just a baseline to start from together with a common understanding of the notions at stake. Um, when you provide definition for a training, it's always very frustrating. Frustrating for those uh, who know little about gender and sex dimension because they would like to know more also from a theoretical point of view. And that's not the purpose of a training uh, like that one. We just need working definition and frustrating for those who know already quite a big deal uh, because they might find uh, the definition a bit unsatisfactory, okay? So let's take them for what they are. Working definition meant to provide a baseline for a common understanding of the 30 plus people in the virtual room so that we know what we are talking about together today, okay? And for more substantial uh, discussion, uh, there are many, many tools and many resources available for that. Um, one of the things that is frustrating 
for instance, for gender scholar like me, is that we have to get back to uh, to the start and to uh, to 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 acknowledge um, the usefulness of maintaining at first um, um, a distinction between sex and gender, a working dis uh, distinction, a functional distinction, uh, because gender as a concept was uh, built as a useful category for analysis, precisely because sex was not covering uh, what gender was intending to uh, reveal and to unravel. So if we refer to, uh, to, to sex by opposition to gender, we will refer rather in general to uh, the biologically determined characteristics of men and women uh, in terms of reproductive organs and functions based for instance on chromosomal complement and physiology. So as such, sex is globally understood as a classification of living things, either as male or female. But immediately we know that this is not actually fully true and that uh, although this uh, binarity is rather fixed, sex cannot be fully encapsulated into it for different reasons, because there are uh, men living things, uh, not uh, withstanding human beings who do not fit within this binarity. Um, and second, uh, secondly, because uh, actually sex can be changed uh, and can and change over a life course because of hormones, because of age, which is related to hormones, uh, uh, and because also of uh, 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 mindly intervention, uh, of uh, human intervention uh, onto it. So sex, generally speaking, is rather related to physiology, but not, but not in this fully binary way. And it is uh, uh, something which is rather fixed, but not full. By opposition, gender was shaped as a useful category of analysis by the late 60s, first in clinical psychology, then it moved to uh, uh, anthropology, then to sociology, then to history and all the social sciences before irrigating uh, virtually all uh, research uh, disciplines. And it referred to the social constriction of women and men, but also femininity and masculinity, which is not the same thing, um, which is a body of expectations, of values, of uh, rules, of social rules, uh, which are usually imposed over people. Uh, and those rules, uh, those categories vary across time and place. And of course, between cultures, they are not the same in one place or one period of time. So as a concept, gender is something which is more fluid than sex, which is more subject to change. I will take the reaction uh, in a minute because I see there are a few comments in the chat box. Um, it is a bit more, it's more free than sex, but we know also that the changes related to gender roles in society usually take time and they can take some time, a hell of time. Uh, and so it is something which is more, which is freer than sex, but not that much while sex is rather fixed but not that much. So there are a lot of overlapping sometimes between the two categories. Nevertheless, this distinction is useful to emphasize the social and historical and cultural dimension of gender vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, things which are more related, variables which are more related to physiology or to the functioning of the human body, generally, generally speaking. Let's maybe address a couple of the comments that were posted. Um, practical question, uh, we, uh, do we share the slide after? Yes, sorry, I should have tell it, told it. Okay, so we share the slide. And about the lectures from Regit Zagrasek, I have not heard about it, Carolina. So there might be a mistake or misunderstanding with respect to another event of Gender Equality Academy, you may check, but this is not here. Um, with regard to uh, these two categories, and if we want to be a little bit less binary, which is also useful, uh, we can look at this gender bred person. Uh, it looks a bit childish, but actually tells a lot. Biology, we see that there are actually scales, that there are like con continuums uh, upon which people, individuals can place themselves or be placed by society, be allocated by society with respect to different aspects. Biology, again, so what is miserable uh, through uh, organs, hormones, chromosome, whatever. Sexual orientation, which has definitely little to do with it and which is basically whom you are attracted to. 
your gender identity, how you conceive yourself with respect to gender categories that have been built by society around you, and you might fit those categories or you might not, and your gender expression, how you actually demonstrate or perform your gender, uh, both in relation to your gender identity and to what is expected uh, in terms of gender expression by society. And those different things uh, 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 are present in every single individual, uh, no matter we are straight or, uh, uh, or homosexuals, no matter uh, we are queer <laughs> or we believe to be or um, 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 consider we are or not, we are positioning ourselves on those different scales. And there is also this concept that was mentioned in the, one of the expectation, uh, which is intersectionality. Um, and intersectionality um, is, uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, interesting because it is a very disputed concept nowadays. Um, um, and I will not enter neither in the theoretical nor political discussion, but I will just uh, uh, invite you to acknowledge something. As individuals, we are necessarily a mosaic of identity. We are necessarily the crossroad, hence the intersection of different um, identity uh, streams, things that define us, that may not define us forever, like education, because we can change our educational level, nor class, because we, change, we can change our social class, uh, or it can be changed for us, um, nor in terms of ability, because we may uh, uh, change our ability level because of an accident or chronic disease or age, or age is changing over a life course or gender, uh, uh, expression might change as well, our culture. Uh, um, we, we, we won't change our cultural background, but we may change it by acquiring new languages or changing countries and so on. And there are a few say, things that hardly change like our ethnicity, uh, race, which is re uh, referred to in, few, in, uh, in certain cultural contexts and not others like mine in France. We don't talk never about race, but we can talk about ethnicity to some extent. Uh, our sexuality, education, and so on. So we, we, we are necessarily at the crossroad of different streams, not to the same extent, or not, they do not define our life and our opportunities and our position in society to the same extent, whether we are men and women, whether we are uh, with a et different ethnic background with respect to the majority of the place where we live, whether we have a migratory background, whether we are coming from a lower or mid or higher social class, if that can be defined that way, uh, this will influence differently our lives. But no matter who we are, even me, white, Western, heterosexual man, belonging to many majorities, uh, I'm nevertheless uh, the intersection of a few things and my ability can change over my life course. My age will definitely, uh, and my position as a migrant, for instance, may change. If I have to change country because of economic opportunities, I might be in a different position elsewhere and my situation will be different. So this applies to virtually everyone. And uh, religious belief, uh, as it has been posted uh, in the chat box, can also play a role uh, uh, m in many cases in relation to the place where you come from. And yes, as it is posted by Macrit, um, those things, those different streams play a role from different perspectives, either as an identity that we, you will reivindicate, you assign to yourself, so to say, um, you consider yourself as Jewish or as uh, uh, being um, a bisexual person and so on and so on, um, or, and that's happen often in relation to, to, to your own vision, to your own positioning on those scales, um, that can be imposed by society or even by a regime that can decide that you belong to that group and that will uh, uh, ensure that you uh, get what is uh, forcing for that group in terms of discrimination or, or, or persecution even. So that's a complex notion, this notion of identity, because there is both self-recognition of who you are and the impact of what the society wants you to be. So this is, uh, this is what we are talking about. We are talking about notions which are relatively complex, which embark both identity and assignment.
So if having those, um, um, those um, very basic definition in mind and not entering much into the theoretical notion, but like just acknowledging that we are diverse people, that we may face different situations based on our identity and that gender as a social construct may impact both men and women uh, uh, in society, but uh, in different ways. Uh, we should look at the situation that we have in research in the academia. And I will uh, here go quickly through a few issues, a few problems, problems which explain why we are here today. If we have to talk about the integration of the gender dimension in research, it's, be it's because there are a few issues, there are a few problems which have been well identified, documented also with data and that we should pay attention to as researchers or as people evolving in research and the academia. The first big picture is horizontal segregation. And this graph coming from she figures, she figures being the uh, pluriannual compendium of sex disaggregated and gender disaggregated data produced by the European Commission for the EU 27, not 28 as it is written here, not anymore. Um, uh, and it's also important to, uh, to see that, uh, to notice that the only specific uh, statistical compendium handbook produced every four or five years by the European Commission on a specific area, a specific topic is about research and innovation. So there might be problems which are specific to our field or which are especially noticeable in our field, which is also reason why we are here today. So look at horizontal segregation. This graph should be looked at from two, uh, two uh, perspectives, from two distances, actually. If we, you do like myself, you look at it from a distance, what you see is that on average, men and women are distributed unevenly uh, across uh, research and higher education fields. Looking at the uh, percentage of female researchers in those fields, you see that they are far less in engineering and technology, uh, uh, quite less in natural sciences, um, that it is a bit more balanced uh, uh, in medical uh, science, and that there are uh, a majority of women in uh, several countries as concerns social sciences and humanity. So the situation is different uh, in terms of research fields. If you look closer, what you see immediately is that the situation is much different according to countries as well. And this is because it is about gender here, not sex. It is um, about the different ways uh, discipline is conceived in one particular context with respect to its history, to, its, to the history of the institution in that field uh, in terms of being like more proper for men or women or more attractive to men and or women. And the situation in every single research field will be different for each country. This is what we see also here. An example, for countries from, um, uh, that were uh, submitted to uh, post-socialism, to socialist, uh, sorry, to state socialism uh, uh, between the 1940s and the 19, uh, late 1980s, the hierarchy of knowledges, the organization of research itself was completely put upside down. It was changed a lot uh, because um, what was important in Western countries uh, was less important in uh, Eastern European countries and uh, vice versa. And this had also an impact on uh, uh, the representation of women in different fields. Uh, and also those countries had a very strong push for integrating women in the workforce and in higher education, which eventually led to uh, their higher presence in a few uh, STEM fields, for instance. That's just an example, but that tells you that the context matter, the history of each discipline in every single country matter, uh, the history of access of women to higher education matter to explain those differences. But generally speaking, men and women are not distributed similarly across research field. And we know that sometimes you have like very small pools uh, of female researchers to recruit from, for instance, in certain STEM fields like computer sciences or physics uh, or certain part of astronomies and more in others. This is all related to the history of those disciplines, but also to context. And this horizontal segregation comes with another type of segregation, which is vertical, which is in terms of accessing the different um, 
stages uh, of, uh, of the carrier uh, ladders. Uh, you, you, you have different stages which are a bit um, standardized across Europe. So you can see them in those two figures coming also from she figures. Um, if we look from the student level, like undergraduate, graduate, uh, postgraduate, um, a PhD, which is uh, uh, roughly uh, the third, uh, the third um, category, the third scale, um, um, and then grade C, grade B, grade A, uh, towards more senior position. What we see in STEM fields on the left of the screen is a situation where women are largely underrepresented from the beginning of the career, and this underrepresentation increases over the course of the career. And uh, for very senior position, uh, the proportion of, men, uh, of women in STEM fields, um, uh, that is science, engineering, technology, mathematics, uh, is about 15%, while it is about 30% at the beginning of the career. If you look at all research areas together, what we have is a CISER uh, uh, diagram. A CISER because women are now overrepresented, they are outnumbering men, in uh, many fields, which make that on average, uh, there are about 55% of, uh, of uh, women uh, uh, involved in, uh, in uh, higher education. And they remain at a similar level or uh, outnumbering men until the PhD level. And from postdoc level, uh, uh, the, 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 the two curves, uh, the, the gap between the two curves is broadening, is deepening and uh, uh, toward the, the more senior position, you have about 44% 44 of women and uh, about 78% uh, uh, of men. So these are, uh, this is a situation that we have. Uh, so it's different from same field, which is worth noticing uh, because it's not reflecting yet uh, the massive feminization of higher education in Europe. But even where the uh, massive feminization of higher education is uh, already visible, as on the second graph, uh, we see that there is still a gap and that this gap is deepening. So that might be related to demographics. People who are now in senior position enter the, into the scientific careers earlier on, at a time when probably there were less women in those fields, uh, but that does not account for everything. What do you think is happening in the middle or toward the end of the first part of those graphs? What is happening that would explain uh, this change and this deepening gap? Yes, Marta, possible explanation. What would you, what will you uh, think? So you can use the chat box and maybe uh, tentatively uh, drop uh, a couple of explanation for this uh, gap uh, increasing from, uh, let's say, um, a moment when people are depending on the countries and the competitiveness and the, and the precarity, precariousness of the research and academic field. Uh, they are between their late 20s at best or their uh, uh, early 40s at worst. Yeah, impossible work balance, leaky pipeline. We come to the leaky pipeline next. Uh, that's also part of the explanation. So you don't have the same, Marta tell us that you don't have the same contacts or network or supporting network, but a few people are mentioning like Marinella or Larry, uh, carrying responsibilities in, in, in possible work-life balance, Elvira, children. Let's make it more consistent. Um, is that children the problem? Because I, I heard that men had children too. Or is it, act, as some of you put it, work-life balance? But work-life balance also should be for men and, and women, right? So the family burden is higher on women. Yes, because it is about gender. So there are different social roles attributed to men and women with respect to caring responsibilities, which are still in the European Union um, um, taken charge of 85% up to 90% by women. So that's pretty a big difference. There are changes, but the changes are very slow in terms of uh, distribution of domestic uh, tasks and caring tasks within the family or within the household. 
so the changes are too slow to uh, make a big difference yet. So still, uh, the caring responsibilities are very much put uh, upon women. Uh, caring responsibilities are not exclusively about children. It is about aging parents. It is about dependent people. It is about uh, relatives with these chronic diseases or disabilities. Um, it's about the mental charge of the maintenance of the household, but it plays a lot of pressure in terms of work-life balance, predominantly over women. And this usually increases when people have to make decisions with respect or choices with respect to having children or not. That is roughly at the moment where they are in position of getting tenured or of achieving uh, a more permanent, more stable, slightly better paid position in research in the academy with a lot of differences across country, which explain that this is precisely when things are happening. Um, may I add something? Well, yes. Um, I don't, I think it's uh, most of the problem is in women, in the, in, in the women head. Huh? We feel responsible. We make the sacrifice. We think that the family has to be together. We have to take care of someone and we have to do it. It's, uh, it's our decision. Uh, yes, but you, you know, a decision that you take because every single aspect of society is shaped for you to take it is still your decision. Right, I do yeah. agree with that. But it's a decision which is very much conditioned by your surrounding circumstances. Yes, but the fact it is, is it's that it creates different opportunities for you. No, but listen, I, ha I, get, I give master, cl master uh, classes to many people. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them, why did you choose this, this master? And girls, they tell me in a very high number is because I have a boyfriend here. I have never heard this question, this answer for it from a from a guy. You see, so yes, but that's not statistical, you know. So I what maybe, I what I take from your reaction. Sorry, I have to interrupt you because yes, um, we are a large group, and I, uh, I prefer to uh, mainly use yet at this stage as chat box for interaction, and because also I want to go through these different issues. But I take the point. Uh, what I take from your from your intervention is uh, what I want to highlight is the nexus between people's individual choices, which is a way to frame their decision from, okay, this is a choice of someone, okay? I choose to be, best, to be paid less. I choose not to pursue into the career. I choose to take all the burden of the caring responsibility upon my shoulders. I, I choose, I choose, I choose. Yes, but the, there is a context for it. And uh, there are unconscious bias that we will uh, discuss later on that both men and women share to the same extent, but with different uh, consequences for them. And there is uh, the uh, structure around us, our organization, the way a career is organized, the different steps, the expectation which are conveyed to the people in terms of what should be their attitude with respect to caring, with respect to love, with respect to work. And uh, we are in a matrix uh, of expectation linked to gender roles that applies both to men and women and that color their decision very much. And this is what we have to, to be conscious of. But I, I, I need to uh, provide you more data to support that before you, you can eventually see better that nexus. But definitely, yes, people are uh, influenced and colored in their decision. And uh, this might impact differently uh, girls and uh, boys and women and men later in their life. I check also the chat box, sorry. Yes, some are putting that, uh, attributing that to deep-rooted patriarchy or to uh, historically ingrained uh, 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 attitude. Uh, and I will tend to, to agree with that, that there are social norms that make uh, our decision uh, quite uh, under influence in many respects. But what we should look at at this stage is only to a matter of fact. Because of these uh, social roles, because of these decisions that people make at a very um, important point of their life, both personally, but also with respect to their work, at some point, there is a gap deepening and there are different opportunities and constraints placed, uh, placed or endorsed by individuals. And I think we, uh, we should agree uh, at least about that. Another way to look at that 
is to look at it from the perspective of the leaky pipeline. So the leaky pipeline uh, of women of science is basically looking at the same thing, uh, that there are less and less women as we move up the career ladder. But the leaky pipeline is showing also something different. It's showing that it is not that only that people make choice, as it was said, at some point and decide to leave. It is that they are also dropping and not coming back. And by dropping from the system, from the pipeline of knowledge, from the pipeline of skills, from the pipeline of uh, creativity, which is irrigating uh, science and innovation, uh, they usually take their creativity, their skills, their training, their capacities with them. And they do not pour it back into the pipeline. They might use it elsewhere in private life, in uh, mounting a business later on in their lives, in their uh, voluntary work. Uh, they do not stop to be useful people uh, by any mean, yet they drop out from the pipeline and they don't get back to it. So the pipeline somehow is to be fixed. It's not only about people's decision and people's choices. It's about also how science and higher education organization can retain people by paying more attention to those different levels of constraints placed upon them by gender roles. At least it's a way to fix part of the problem. You cannot change people's decision. You cannot interfere even with people's decision. But what you can do is try to make the, uh, the pipeline a little bit more tight uh, and welcoming so uh, that you want to stay in it and uh, to keep, uh, to keep uh, 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 providing your knowledge and also to achieve, to be able to achieve uh, a higher position uh, in your, uh, in, uh, in this field. Checking again the chat box. Um, if we look also to, the big, to this bigger picture, what we see is not only imbalances that might reflect only different aspiration or different decision made by people. What we see are also bias, which is different uh, because a bias can hardly be attributed to uh, one's people uh, decision, okay? So the bias are noticeable, for instance, in terms of accessing resources in research and the academia. Um, even if we take into account the pool of potential candidates or applicants to a grant process, for instance, to, uh, uh, for securing a research grant, either individual or for a project, uh, even if we take into account the pool at the beginning, that there might be only 40% of women in the pool or 20% in one particular discipline where they are overly, uh, grossly underrepresented, even taking that into account, what we see is that as the process, uh, the process for selection of the applicants and the future awardees is going on, the gap between male and female applicant is deepening. So as the process, for instance, gets personal through interviews where you have to defend your project, where you have to explain who you are, why, what is the composition of your team, why you are making the research about this very topic, uh, the gap is deepening, okay? So this is calling attention on something which is different from a uh, mere decision. If we look to the ERC calls, so the ERC, as you know, are one, are one of the most like most demanding and attractive uh, research grant in Europe, because basically you get a lot of money to carry out your own research agenda and you are able to uh, hire people and you can go virtually wherever you want in the European research area. So it's something which is very competitive and attractive. So here what we see is that the proportion of women, both among panelists, members of selection committees, and among uh, applicants is relatively low. It's, uh, uh, around 30% and uh, can go down uh, depending on disciplines uh, to 15 or to 20% reflecting the horizontal segregation that we have seen at first. But what we see, which is even more worrying somehow because it is not the state of co only, it is not a matter of pool, it's a matter of bias, is that the proportion of grantees is always even smaller and sometimes significantly on average, the difference is 4%, four percent, four points uh, between the percent of um, applicants, female applicants to ARCs and the percentage of grantees. So that might reflect that women on average are 
now we're performing in research, but that's, contra con that's very much contradictory to what we have seen uh, for all research disciplines where women are overperforming men in higher education, at least till the PhD level, which is reflected in outnumbering men as well. This is just because they work, uh, they are performing better. So it's a bit suspicious to uh, think that they are suddenly performing less well later on in their careers. So that might indicate, be a good indicator that there are some selection bias involved. And this is something we should pay attention to as well. Another good indicator is gender bias in access to international research mobility. So just like for ERC in general or research grant, which are very important for a researcher to pursue a research agenda over his career and to progress in this career, international mobility is very important as well. At some point, it's nearly, um, in some disciplines, it's nearly compulsory to do some research abroad uh, uh, for a while. So here we are considering international mobility as something uh, mid and long term. So uh, it's not a couple of weeks, it's either six months or over that you are pursuing research opportunities abroad. What we see here, again, like for the first graph about horizontal segregation, it's a complex situation, not one-sided or black and white one. We see that in a few countries, Ireland, Slovakia, Poland, Israel, uh, there are significant gap to the detriment of women. Men are definitely more mobile internationally by about 10%, which is a significant gap, especially if you consider the opportunities it brings you in terms of salary, in terms of contact, networks, opportunities. If we look to the other side of the graph, we see that in Luxembourg, Denmark, or Switzerland, women are slightly more mobile than men by about 4%. How would you explain both situations? The biggest gap in a few countries like Ireland, Slovakia, Poland, or Israel to the detriment of women in terms of international mobility and the smaller gap to the apparently benefit in a few countries like Denmark, Luxembourg, and Switzerland. Do you have any clue to explain one or the two situation? Because it tells a lot actually. Childcare, uh, that's a, a guess by uh, Heidi, that might be different. Um, Childcare will work as an explanation for the country of destination. Whether you have more or less childcare option in the country of destination, that might be more or less attractive for men and women and for couples, provided uh, uh, the different uh, role of the two sexes with respect to care duties, okay, in society. But it does not much apply to the country of origin, because uh, you will hardly let for six months your children in your country of origin. Right. Housing ladder might also play a role in the country of destination or with respect to your career in general at home, but not much explanatory of international mobility. A regulatory framework that enables men to be more flexible to follow women that might be an explanation for fixing the gap, uh, Marinella. This definitely is something that can help people to make choices independently of their gender and to pursue their opportunities because they will get some support. But here, it does not explain why in Slovakia or Ireland or Poland, the, the, the gap is bigger. Pressure from families not to move. We are getting closer uh, from Haiti. Uh, uh, if you look at Ireland, Slovakia, Poland, and Israel, they do share a major sociological feature. These are countries where um, religious factors still very much influence social models. It changed a lot. In every single of those countries, it changed a lot. Look at the demonstration in Poland. Look at uh, the referenda about uh, 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 abortion or about uh, gay marriage in Ireland. So the situation is not one-sided. and Slovakia has a female president. But um, uh, still, there, is, um, there are family models and gender roles attached to these family models, which are still very much rooted into religious, social, and cultural models. So it's not religion as such which play a big role. It's the influence, the long-lasting historical influence of religion over social models, and especially about the roles of mothers and their position in family, which tend to decrease in those countries the opportunities 
for women to move out because there will be little social and family support for them to drag the whole family outside whether it will be, while it will be more um, understandable for men. That's a bit one-sided, but that definitely plays a role because this is a common feature of these four countries. If you look to the other side, the situation is different. If you are a researcher and you are based in Luxembourg, in Denmark, or in Switzerland, um, basically uh, uh, you do not want to move much because if you are a postdoc in Denmark, you can make up to 5,000 euros a, a, a month, you know? And you have in those three countries, research facilities, which are like quite qualitative. So you might not be uh, so dragged to, towards international mobility, but since it's very competitive inside, there might be bias against female researchers, which oblige them to be slightly more mobile than men to pursue similar opportunities that they hardly get at home, okay? So you see, uh, the, the, you see that the situation is a bit, uh, is a bit um, uh, different. Um, but again, that's not completely one-sided because someone mentioned that in Italy, you may have also still strong family roles and so on. Um, yes, true ID, but the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, the fertility rate is lower. So the, 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 the constraint in place over women is also lower than for instance, it is in Ireland or in, uh, or in Poland or even in Israel. So different factors play, but it gives you a glimpse of the different social cultural factors that can play a role and also of the structure of the research areas itself that can be more or less prone uh, to, uh, uh, to support women and men's opportunities to a similar level. But again, that's an indication that they are biased. And here we need to have a short discussion about what gender biases are and how they are being produced and fueled. And there is an option to help us for that. And here we will be able to have a, a, a brief discussion and uh, I can let you in more into the discussion now that we cover these different issues. There are gender bias in knowledge production because of history first, there is a masculine image of silence. And here I cheated a bit. I put my keywords in Google in Polish language. And by using Polish language, I get more uh, 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 pictures of women because of Marie uh, Sklodowska Curie and uh, her daughter, Irene Jolio Curie. But the situation would not be that good in other countries. So you might try with your own language, language also matter because of the tenses, fe female or female that you can use. Uh, but you will see that there is still this, uh, that the Google algorithm, which is biased, is uh, very much reflecting this historical situation of male dominance over scientific uh, fields. But behind this male dominance in the scientific fields, there is an effect that has been coined in the literature by the, um, uh, the 1990s, and which is called the Matilda effect which was coined by Margaret Rossiter, a uh, Canadian historian of science um, uh, uh, a couple of decades ago. And she described the systematic invisibilization of women scientists contribution. So it's not only that women have been long uh, barred from accessing uh, higher education. Remember that in Central Europe, for instance, in the former Austrian Hungarian empire, women could enroll in higher education very late in the 19th century. Uh, and that has necessarily an impact over their presence historically in those uh, uh, institutions. When I'm walking the corridor leading to a rector's office in uh, a venerable uh, Italian or French or Portuguese university or Spanish university from Salamanca to Coimbra to Bologna to Paris, Sorbonne, all the portraits in the corridor leading me to the rector's office who might eventually be a woman nowadays are male. So this is reflecting this long history of exclusion and predominance of male within science, which is correlated also to the erasement, uh, uh, overlooking, undermining, uh, under uh, consideration put on women scientists' contribution in different fields. Rosalind Franklin's overlooked role in discovering the DNA, Liz Meitner's foundational work on nuclear fission uh, not being uh, recognized, or even movie star Eddie Lamar, uh, whose invention paves the way for the Wi-Fi technology, 
uh, and who, uh, was just like uh, a patent was not used before it, uh, uh, it was uh, over that uh, she, she didn't have to be acknowledged as owning the patent. So there are many examples of that. And if you look at your own fields, you may, uh, you may find a number of examples of this, uh, this uh, uh, underrepresentation. One woman in Ireland, Eileen did the test for, I for Ireland by looking for women. That usually, you know, the, the standard. One woman in the first page, and then you, if you, you, you get the picture smaller, you see that they are really grossly underrepresented, uh, definitely in many countries. Uh, so the, the, the search will be different, the, uh, will uh, hint different results, whether you use female or male tenses, depending on your languages, but famous scientists generally return this type of result, no matter the tense. And if we have like um, institution that historically have been very much male dominated, because of the exclusion of women of knowledge production activities for very long. And long after they could enter uh, those fields because the structure was already there, the practices, the, um, um, the, the prestige, uh, the, uh, uh, the traditions were already ingrained and still very much influences. There is also good chances uh, that research and knowledge produced by those gender biased institution will be itself gender blind or even gender biased. So by gender blindness, we uh, refer to the fact of failing to take into account potential sex differences, as well as the gendered roles and conducts of men and women in society, their relation to risk, their uh, health habits, uh, their, uh, the type of work they uh, perform, as a type uh, uh, of uh, caring responsibilities falling uh, upon them, and so on and so on. Their diet, whatever. So this is not related directly to sex, it's related to gender roles. But sex differences, biological, physiological differences, your body mass, your height on average, uh, your uh, uh, bone mass, et cetera, et cetera, plays also a role. And this role, just as gender, is very often disregarded by research we produce because we produce that research in settings which are themselves biased and historically male centered. The picture is like uh, uh, very common, you know it, you, you, you probably seen it uh, before, uh, 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 a pregnant uh, uh, car crash dummy. Um, just to reflect that for very long between uh, the invention of the safety belt uh, uh, in uh, the late 40s in the US to its generalization in most, by most car factors uh, in the second part of the 1970s. But until the mid 2000s, safety belts were based on a body design that was the one of a man and not every man, an average Western white man, not me even, you know, much taller. Uh, so, uh, uh, with a specific body mass, with a specific age, and obviously when you design passive and active safety devices on a car, for instance, it has a lot of implication. You will not go through the window, through the wi uh, screen window, uh, 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 to the same speed. You will not be exposed to shocks the same way. Your body will not react to it the same way. And for decades and decades, that was not even taken into account. That was a standard man, period. And that applies to a lot of research field. Um, do you have an idea of which car manufacturer started, by the way, because it tells a bit as well, to uh, look uh, a little bit more into the details and to use uh, uh, children, to use uh, uh, um, uh, uh, women, to use even pregnant women? Eileen, Volvo, indeed. A Swedish by then, now Chinese car manufacturer. Uh, and, uh, and that was also related to uh, advancement of mainstreaming gender in uh, policies and uh, research areas in Sweden by the mid 2000s that eventually led the car manufacturer to consider such basic aspects, which sounds like really basic, but was completely disregarded before. What was the result, by the way? The result was that by the mid of the 2000s, the second uh, um, uh, circumstance for prenatal deaths in developed countries were car crashes. 
because the safety devices that were meant to protect the life of people were actually provoking the death of uh, the fetuses. Uh, and they were no longer viable or the women were so severely hurt uh, that uh, they, they, had this, uh, uh, they, 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 they had these consequences. And by the way, women, because of gender role in society, because of education, because of expectation uh, toward them, are far less likely to suffer a crash accident and to, re to be responsible for it than men. And we know that it is reflected in uh, police insurance uh, 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 amounts that differ for both men and women or deferred because there were some regulation, but uh, because it was also uh, a gender imbalance to the expense of men in this case. Um, but when they do suffer a car crash, they are far more at risk of suffering several uh, serious injuries because most of the cars do not still fit their bodies. And in Europe, women account for roughly the health of the drivers on a daily basis. So this has serious consequences uh, everywhere and that should be also uh, a driver for more gender sensitive research, right? Other examples which are quite common are those related uh, also uh, coming this time from the medical uh, area and related to cardiovascular diseases. Cardiovascular diseases are interesting basically because uh, they are very gendered and they have been very gendered for long. Um, men were far and are still significantly more exposed to suffering cardiovascular diseases than women, but the gap is narrowing significantly because this is much related to what, by the way, what is related, uh, what is the cause of most cardiovascular, cardiovascular diseases or chronic diseases, including like diabetes and so on. You can use the chat box. What is the main drivers for it? Stress is one of them, but men and women do uh, suffer stress alike, but they might have long encountered different type of stress with respect to their um, uh, professional situation. Obesity, overweight indeed, which is still affecting to a greater extent uh, 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 one takes over the others, but the gap is really uh, narrow now. But habits, health habit, um, uh, the the way you uh, the way you drink, the, your alcohol consumption, the way you smoke, uh, uh, the way you take pills, which kind of pills you take, uh, lifestyle, was uh, lack of activity uh, may have also played a role. And then on the top of that, different hormones, different genes, which react differently to these external factors. But the factors, the external factors were, are predominant. Uh, you suffer cardiovascular disease mostly because of your uh, general health condition in relation to your habits, to your expo exposure to addiction, level of stress and sedentarity. And men and women having different lifestyle because of their different gender roles and expectation uh, uh, this has created a huge gap in terms of exposure to cardiovascular diseases, which has started to narrow down when women were allowed into paid employment, increasing level of professional stress, um, with some, to some extent with contraception, true, uh, which uh, uh, had impact on hormonal uh, behavior. Um, when they start to smoke in similar proportion or greater proportion nowadays than men, and to drink more because it was more socially acceptable at some point. So all of that had an impact. So now the situation is that men are still suffering more, but that the gap is narrowing. But another gap is narrowing. Since women are now suffering cardiovascular diseases in significant proportion, for instance, heart failure, less than men, but still quite to some extent, uh, they are more at risk of dying from it, just like for car accident. They are more at risk of dying from it simply because their symptoms are not the ones that are usually recognized by medical personnel or by uh, the family or by people around. Because the symptoms we know about heart attack, about heart failure, as the one of men, not the one of women, cold sweat, unusual tiredness, nausea and vomiting, sudden dizziness, headburn like feeling, which to be honest could be something else. Uh, uh, with respect to, um, and, uh, so still pathophysiology is related to sex differences. Yes, sex matter. This is what we are talking about as well. It is about physiology, 
and it is about gender. It is about your behavior and uh, your, the behavior dictated also by society. And it is about your physiology. Just as for car crashes, it is society that prevented women from driving for a long time and that led car manufacturers not even to consider them as potential driver. But it is their body mass, which is physiological which uh, will have an impact on the movement of their body inside a car, you know, put upside down by a car crash. So sex and gender matter here very much and have been both disregarded largely. So the two count, I do agree with Carolina on that. Here you have also a, um, a graph showing different risk of cancer uh, linked to exposure to relatively low level of uh, radiation, uh, 20 micro uh, 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 siever. And, um, and you see that even with exposure rates, which are relatively mild, the difference in uh, uh, exposure to cancer is relatively high. And this is related mostly to sex, that is to your body envelope, uh, to your muscular uh, 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 mass that will more or less uh, protect your organs from uh, radiation and so on and so on and that might be also uh, linked to a reaction linked to hormonal cycle and so on so this is much sex related why is to take such examples just to tell us that we should not be surprised we should not be surprised that if our history in relation to science and knowledge production is gendered if our institution have been long gendered and are still the knowledge which is produced by those institutions, which is published in the journals that we have with the process of validation of knowledge that we do have now, are gender biased as well. That should not come as a surprise. There is a continuum between those different situations and the different data we have discussed before. But there are things that can be done to fix that. But first we have to acknowledge that there are bias. If we come to another example coming from STEM, we see that in something so important like artificial intelligence for economical development and the future of society for good and bad reasons, asking, asking me for bad ones. But I mean, that's a matter of fact that uh, artificial intelligence will uh, regulate a lot of acti human activities over the, the uh, upcoming decades. And on the basis of artificial intelligence or algorithm, and there are studies like that one delivered by Institut Montaigne, which shows that every single step in developing and implementing an algorithm from data collection through data labeling, labeling through the type of users, uh, through the feedback which is collected from users, through the management of those who develop and implement and commercialize this algorithm, everything can be exposed to different kinds of bias, technical and social omitted variables, poor databases, um, um, poor data selection process, but also economic uh, habits or economic objectives influence the algorithm, cognitive aspect also in terms of how it is being used, emotional aspects uh, with regard to coloring our judgment or our decision. And all of that will be computed into the algorithm uh, uh, and will influence very much artificial intelligence with the result that we know as well, which is that artificial intelligence devices uh, tend to be discriminatory. They work differently for people depending on the color of their skin, on their age, on their sex, on their gender expression, and on the intersection of those different aspects. So no surprise that the matches of those devices developed by Microsoft, Face Plus, or IBM are close to 100% efficiency for lighter skinned male people and quite efficient for lighter female, uh, lighter skinned female people, but a bit less for darker skinned male people and much less for darker female people, darker skinned female people with uh, about 65% efficiency rate with a gap uh, which can rose uh, 35% uh, depending on basically whom you are. So uh, this has a serious consequence and you can figure out right now what those consequences could eventually be if artificial 
intelligence will you will be used would be used even more widely uh, for uh, governing societies. If those biases exist, it is simply because they are easily accessible to us. We have biases all around us without even noticing, and they color very much every single decision we make. If we take the definition of unconscious bias, which is a very popular notion nowadays, maybe also because it exonerates us a little bit of our responsibilities because of this unconscious notion, I do agree. Most bias are unconscious. We are biased without wanting to be. But we may have benefit from being biased or suffering from those bias to a greater extent, depending on the color of our skin or our gender. So that should not be uh, disregarded. But generally speaking, yes, unconscious bias occur when we make judgment or decision on the basis of our prior experience, of own personal deep-seated thought patterns, of assumptions or interpretation. And we are not aware that we are doing it. So based on this small definition, short definition, how often would you think uh, we are exposed to unconscious bias? Frequently, not that frequently, rarely, extremely frequently. What is your vision? Based on that definition, th that um, all the time, according to ID, other views from you? Frequently, each day, Basically, if you take that definition, I would tend to believe that it is almost all the time. Anytime we are not thinking actively, anytime that we are not studying every single aspect of a problem or situation, we are biased. And the irony is that it is because our brain is efficient. It is because we are human beings. And being human beings, we have the chance to be able to make quick judgment before even judging a situation based on what we already learned. We are fast learners. We have a deep memory. We memorize situation and codes related to the situation, our brain act accordingly. This is a byproduct of our efficient cognition. Discriminating etymologically, it's making a choice between two terms. We do that all the time. Anytime we are on a crossroad uh, with our car or while driving a bike or even walking, we make choices not to, uh, uh, to have an accident or not to bump into someone. And usually we manage because we are efficient. This is about discrimination all the time. The problem is, is that we do exactly the same thing when, when we make a decision about someone, when we make a decision about the quality of a research, or when we make a decision about who is worse to uh, receive 1 million euros grant or not. And this has a deep impact on people's um, opportunities and it is not related to their merit. It is related to our thought pattern, to our prior experience, which are very much colored by gender and other type of bias, ethnic bias, social bias, educational bias. Why? Uh, I will show you a short video, two minutes. We are like about two minutes 50 late on the program, but that's not much. So I will show you that video. I will stop sharing my screen one second so that I can access it. Maybe you already know it's from the Royal Society for the Advancement of Science in the UK. It is short, but it tells a lot. It is mostly about recruitment, but you can apply the functioning of the bias that is described there to any sort of situation in relation to knowledge production. So. I will stop sharing and I will share again uh, while opening, sorry, opening the link. Okay, and now I'll share this. Just a second. The unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts based on our background, cultural environment, and personal experiences to make almost instantaneous decisions about everything around us. The snag is, it's wrong quite a lot of the time, especially on matters that need rational thinking. Here's a classic example. 
A bat and a ball cost one pound ten pence. If the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people, including over 50% of students at some of the world's leading universities, get the answer wrong and say 10 pence. The answer is actually 5 pence. Many of us choose 10 pence without thinking. This is because our unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis. So our unconscious is fallible. It's also biased. It makes snap judgments of people we meet categorizing them according to gender, social, and other characteristics. In milliseconds, we judge whether somebody is like us and belongs to our in-group. These are the people we favor. So men might favor men, while women might favor women. However, we can belong to different in-groups, and we like to be part of an in-group that's powerful, which could mean a woman favoring a man over a woman. That's unconscious bias. All of us have it, and it colors our decisions without our realizing. For example, research reveals that if I were a man, you would be more likely to be nodding in agreement right now because people pay more attention to a male voice. The Royal Society fosters excellence in science, but this can only be achieved if we select from the widest range of talent. And that's not possible. If unconscious bias is narrowing down the field for non-scientific reasons. To lessen the impact of unconscious bias, which is easier for us to notice in others, we are raising the awareness of unconscious bias to members of our selection and appointment panels. We're encouraging panel members to deliberately slow down decision-making, reconsider reasons for decisions, question cultural stereotypes, and monitor each other for unconscious bias. We can't cure unconscious bias, but with self-awareness, we can address it. So I hope that you that the, the video played well, that there was no, no technical issue. And that shows actually how, uh, how um, um, the unconscious bias are uh, working in general. I will get back to the, to the presentation and why they are so frequent. A notion which is also attached to it is the notion of prejudice. Prejudicare uh, in Latin is what comes before an informed judgment. So a prejudice basically is the decision we make when we do not look at situation or people for what they are, but when we base ourselves on what we think we already know of them, of the situation and or of the people. And what we know from them is dictated very largely to a large extent by bias. That can be also because we know those people already, in which case it is a personal bias. We may know or think to know where they come from, with whom they are friends, which, from which fields uh, they are uh, originating, whether they are good uh, team workers or not. And this is also a bias because it comes before the informed uh, judgment. So this is a very classic situation, but you can imagine that can, it can color also the way you decide to discriminate a variable in a research design, the way you decide to use a methodology rather than another, the way you decide to select your data, and so on and so on. So it is something that can apply to a number of human situations and which does apply to it and explain why those bias are so frequent. It also brings us back to the interesting point that was made earlier by someone, orally, which is that we are all biased, both men and women, and that uh, we may make decisions for ourselves, uh, which might even eventually be detrimental to ourselves, uh, but which will certainly be dependent upon what we think our surrounding, our family, our mates, our friends, our colleagues, our institution, society, our church, our community is expecting from us. So this is not only something that colors the decision you make about others. It is something that colors the decision you make for yourself, which also explain uh, that uh, sometime you might have the feeling that uh, uh, people can put themselves in, in, in situation um, of not fitting the standard. But the standard is a question, not the people. Let's get back to, let's get back to that, by the way. So it is taking into account all of those factors 
that uh, your Europe, European Commission, the European uh, Research Agency have been developing over years a policy and different instrument to tackle gender bias and gender imbalances uh, and gender blindness in research organization. And the journey that these policies have taken, the path they have taken, it's a journey from fixing women, from fixing people to fixing institutions. So nowadays, the main objectives of EU policies in this field um, are the following. Gender equality in scientific careers, so fixing the leaky pipeline, fixing the horizontal and vertical segregation. Gender balance in decision making, fixing the gender gap in accessing resources and, uh, and uh, decision making. Integrating the gender dimension into the content of research and innovation, as we are mostly discussing today. It is a long story, it's over 20 years old because the first European communication, European Commission's communication about women in science, not gender in science, was in 1999. There were basically two, um, two stages. Over the 10 first years of that policy until, let's say, the late 2000, the focus was on individual female researchers. And the idea was that female researchers themselves had a problem. They were not making proper decisions. They were not applying to decision-making position. They were not asking for same, for same salaries. They were not applying and to the same extent to uh, research grant processes, applications, and so on and so on. They were not having the same um, active network uh, uh, and so on and so on. So the idea was that they had a problem and they should be fixed. Fixed by mentoring them, fixed by training them, fixed by um, uh, 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 supporting them uh, by putting a mentor behind every single uh, uh, woman in research, mostly female mentors. So here you see there is a problem of statistics. If your problem is uh, you don't have enough women in a field, that would be difficult to put one woman behind every new uh, potential researcher in that field, right? Doesn't work that way. So this had produced some result, increasing network, increasing awareness, but little change in figure, simply because the problem is not people. What was intended with those policies, it was making those women to fit a standard that had been designed and shaped in a gender insensitive way, that had been designed and shaped mostly at a period when women were not involved in those fields, when they were not part of the picture. So they were meant to fit a standard that was definitely not theirs, but might not be even adequate and adapted to uh, 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 the new profile of researchers, new generation of both men and women involved in the field. For instance, the top, the standard of full dedication to research of long hours of over commitment uh, of overwork is meant to be part of the libido sciendi, of the power of knowledge uh, that drives you as a researcher, great. Yet, if you look at statistics in Europe, the white collar category of workers who care more, who care most about, about work-life balance, family work balance, are researchers of both sexes, of both genders. So this is not true anymore. And from then, a change was, uh, was, uh, was uh, noticeable from this fix the woman, fix the people, approach to a fix the institution approach when it was considered that it was the standard that was to be challenged and the, were, the way institution work that was to be tackled. And from there, a dual approach emerged, which is the one that we will use for uh, our case studies. A dual approach, which is considering equal opportunities of men and women in research on one side and integrating the gender dimension in research content on the other as two faces of the same coin. So if we look at the most recent trends in gendering the European research area, we see that this 20 years old and over policy um, is accelerating. The pace is accelerating and there is kind of a momentum for gendering research uh, uh, nowadays. A greater focus on STEMs and ICTs because of their power to shape economies and societies and because of the greater gender gap, a focus of what are usually called 
lower research intensive or widening countries by the Euro European Commission, mostly located in Central Eastern Europe and a few in Southern Europe, countries that benefit less from EU research funding. So the idea there is to fix the gender gap and the innovation gap at once, increasing the proportion of women involved and increasing the accessibility to those countries of EU research funding. As from this year, and really enforced as from the next, adopting and implementing a gender equality plan becomes an eligibility criteria for accessing Horizon Europe funding. So no plan in the making or enforce no money, to be clear. That's a bit the trend, although it will be a step-by-step -step process, obviously, notably not to discriminate widening countries. And the European Commission to support this change uh, uh, will uh, support research on intersecting inequalities and is updating the tools that will help research performing and research funding organization to implementing that change. So it's not just asking you to change your institution, is to give you insight, training, resources, sometimes money to actually um, uh, do it. We will look at the research cycle. So we will kind of lend a little bit our reflection from the macro variables to the particular circumstances of a research program or project with a lifetime cycle, which is usually quite the same. So it is more project related here than a research career as a whole. It's related to a research endeavor uh, defined by the lifetime of a research cycle. So we will look at this research cycle that I will present you shortly. And I will kindly ask you to uh, generate ideas together, uh, either through the chat box or taking the floor with short comments if possible to leave time to as much people as possible to participate um, about potential gender bias for each step of the research cycle. So we will process that way. Here you have this research cycle with a research idea phase, which is when the idea for the next research emerge, in which circumstances, with whom around the table, and uh, the first uh, ideas are dropped uh, uh, around that will fuel the research design. The next one is precisely when the research is being designed, so usually by several people for a grant application, uh, for instance, the research phase is when the research is being delivered. So the data is collected, it is being analyzed. And the dissemination phase is about communicating results and potential outputs and outcomes of the research to different audiences, which usually leads to a new research idea, hopefully, and to a new research cycle. So we will look first at the, together at the research idea phase. Um, and we will look to the two dimensions. Remember that we are in this dual European approach. In yellow, it is what concerns uh, women's and men's opportunities in research, participation, the position and role they occupy, for instance, in a research team, their respective contribution, how it is being acknowledged, and so on. The red part is about the research, the gender dimension or sex dimension in research content in the very uh, topic and the very uh, design of the research project. So please um, think of the two dimension and their potential relation and try to identify as many potential bias as possible for the research idea phase. Thinking of your own experience, where such ideas usually emerge, in which settings, who is around, who is participating in developing those uh, ideas and how are they uh, uh, developed before uh, to be included in a formal research proposal for a grant application, for instance. So let's take a couple of minutes to think about that on your own. Unfortunately, we cannot interact directly. And then you can drop into the chat box or just take the floor and raise your idea. Okay, so try to first focus on the first phase, even if you, are, you have ideas as Yekta for the next one, that will be useful, but uh, let's be uh, process related. So as for uh, this first phase, focusing on one gender and ignoring the other or others, 
from the idea phase. So you are thinking about a topic that is relevant to you and your research field. Um, and if it's um, something where gender matter, you will focus on one and ignore the other. You will have gender blindness from scratch. Inma is asking who can prepare a proposal. Uh, not uh, like principal investigators have the same weight in the organization. That can be a bias. Who can actually deliver the idea? And which ideas by whom will be the most considered? Uh, people with, uh, who are more assertive, that might be incidentally men and majority, uh, will uh, receive more attention in developing the idea. So there might be a context of interaction, which is detrimental to um, outsiders who might be women a lot. Uh, we can be people from other disciplines, people from other institutions, people from with short time contracts, people with temporary position and so on and so on. Uh, visiting scholars uh, who might be uh, come from elsewhere and who might be less or more, uh, more or less considered. So rather than thinking like in map, that's a recommendation I make to you. Rather than thinking in terms of personal attitude, people being more assertive or people being more humble, which is usually attached to gender stereotypes, women being more humble or more shy and men being more assertive. Stereotypes can be well true because if you are educated in a way, you will, it will deliver uh, its promise in some way. But what is more important here is which kind of settings. If the setting, if the type of interaction we have give a premium to assertiveness rather than to the idea itself. It's a problem. It's not a problem of men or women. It's a problem of the type of interaction we built. So if it's very informal, for instance, if it's uh, at night after a conference uh, during the beer time, that might be a bit exclusive from people who do not drink alcohol, from people who do not feel uh, uh, safe to go out at night in certain uh, contexts, for people who think that informality is unpleasant, uh, uh, and so on and so on, or from people who prefer to be with actual friends rather than colleagues for beer. So it makes a lot of people potentially. So it's usually people who know each other already from previous contacts, who look like each other, remember of the unconscious bias about recognizing people as member of your in-group, who might be convened to talk about the next idea that can be a good one, that can be a poor one, <laughs> uh, but that have, would have to be discussed in more like extensive uh, uh, settings and more um, diversity sensitive settings. There can be also different uh, uh, incense, I, I'm relying upon your contribution, different incentives for you to jump into this research idea phase. You might think, oh, it's a great idea, but I have so many duties. I have care work, uh, I, I have children, I have my uh, uh, research assignment already, I have my teaching assignment, I have administrative work on the top, which is unevenly distributed between men and women, women taking more administrative work and teaching work in universities than men, for instance. And you might decide that, okay, that's a bit over the top. I won't join this research uh, idea, idea phase. So you might also feel that the system um, is play, putting a, three, a threshold which is very high for you to join as potential principal investigator or uh, to lead a research project that you might not feel that your uh, publication record or that your credential are sufficient and that the perception of your credential might differ depending on your gender based on maybe a lower continuity uh, uh, um, of your career because of career breaks or because also of potential unconscious bias that you apply to yourself and that prevent you of valuing your um, educational and research background um, maybe as a man would do. So this can also play a role. That we see that there are already many factors, family commitment, other uh, professional commitment, um, uh, um, um, the setting more or less informal in which a research idea phase is uh, uh, occurring actually, uh, um, the fact to be gender blind from the very scratch, focusing on one particular gender for your future research design, 
um, competition rather than collaboration. I do very much agree with that, which is very much encouraged by project-based research. We have to get money and this is to the expense of others necessarily because resources are limited. And therefore there is strong competition which might lead to exclude both aspect of an idea in terms of content and people uh, from the circle of those developing the idea. So in terms of solution, if we think of something a bit more open, a bit less informal, Informality is fine as long as it is the idea does not stay in the informality, uh, that it is discussed among a greater group of people. Pluridisciplinarity, asking to people with different views and knowledge to uh, give a hint about your idea, to bring it further. Um, sharing it in a reasonable setting. It's not about like disseminating your idea before even carrying out the research so that others can do it and get money and credit for it but it's about within your institution and a, a slightly broadened cycle, starting to discuss it in a more substantive way so that maybe gender or sex related aspect can be taken into account. And so that credit and acknowledgement for people contributing to designing the very idea can be ensured. And this is not only about gender, this is about generation, this is about origin, uh, this is about disciplinary field, this is about uh, uh, professional stages, uh, so that uh, 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 the best insights are involved rather than those coming from a certain unified homogeneous group of people, as it is very much often the case, leading sometimes to dismissing uh, great ideas or great uh, contribution. And the lack of support to drafting proposal within institution. Uh, at research performing organization. The fact that you, uh, you have to rely very much upon yourself, which leads us to the next stage. Okay, quite a number of uh, ideas already. So as for the two next stage, you build your proposal, you build your hypothesis, your team, your, your stream of work. Um, so it's both about management and about content and you deliver the research. Which type of bias can jump in there? Yes, indeed, when you, you, you build a team, I mentioned that your, the assessment of CV is generally gender blind, and I would say even gender biased, because blindness lead, uh, lead closely to bias in this case. If you do not consider different condition for people to be excellent, we talk a lot about excellence in the academia, but we rarely put like proper words behind it or concepts. So what excellence is about? It's about merit. Fine. What is merit about? Is it about uh, doing the same thing or delivering the same number of outputs without having the same life or opportunities? Uh, or is it checking the research intensivity and innovation of people in relation to the work, to the time that they could devote to research based on other uh, social duties that uh, uh, waited upon them? So you may have candidates who had career break or would jump into the uh, NGOs or uh, the private world or family duties and blocked experiences which are different and which during the times they devoted to fully to research activities have published and delivered more output than others. Although the full list of their publication will be shorter because they will have done other things. So looking different things uh, at different things can help you make better decision in terms of uh, knowing who is best fitted to join the research proposal. About the content this time, so the red part, overlooking the gender dimension in drafting the proposal. And the sex dimension also. So uh, it might be utterly relevant to your field. It might be incidentally relevant. Uh, it might be less relevant, uh, but the standard is just to drop it. <laughs> No matter it is very quite or little relevant. Uh, there is no relation between uh, attention for the gender perspective and variables uh, and sex variables and uh, their level of relevance, actual relevance for the work. Because usually this is something which is not being discussed. So discussing that and checking whether it is relevant or not based on literature. Appreciating the input equality from all participants only about talking. This is about distribution of position within the team as well. So input equality, it's uh, 
preventing from reproducing a gender distribution of work within the research team. Some getting more credit because they will be more turned toward dissemination, for instance, or intensive research uh, 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 practice, while others will be on a less rewarding part of the research, which needs to be done as well, but which should be done independent by people independently of their gender, right? So if it's about like very careful data collection or uh, experiment controlling that takes a lot of work, that is very, uh, uh, very demanding in terms of concentration, uh, let's ensure that it is not only something which is uh, for uh, junior researcher or female researcher or researchers from different backgrounds, uh, uh, ethnic background or migratory background or uh, on temporary position, that there is a more sensitive distribution of the work based on uh, skills and competence, uh, and, uh, but based also on other factors and the contribution of people. Uh, move to maybe to the to the last part that is dissemination phase uh, the delivery of outputs uh, the communication of the results uh, the vulgarization also so it's uh, both toward the research audiences and non-research audiences policy audiences whatever which kind of bias do you see that can take place here you don't plan to have children as a as a female researcher um, or you plan to have one, it doesn't make a big difference in terms of the expectation of the world system and the society towards you. They will be framed by the idea that you might have children, and that might decrease your opportunities if it's not properly controlled and uh, compensated for by the organization or the society, society at large. So it's not strictly related to the fact of having children that you may be bar uh, certain opportunities and drop out from the pipeline. The same apply to research mobility. You might be very prone to mobility, no matter you have children or not, just because you, uh, you have a couple where this is uh, uh, easily done or uh, because you are on, uh, on your own or because this is simply your top priority. And still, you might not receive the same opportunities because your appetence, your projects, your expectation will be uh, affected by stereotypes of others from others, okay? So this is really important to, um, to, to emphasize. And Jana mentioning that the Matilda effect can be all around the cycle and also to the dissemination phase, especially to the dissemination phase actually, when it is when you take credit for the research done and that for instance, if you are, um, uh, if you are encouraged to, uh, to, to deliver speeches abroad or to, uh, to, uh, to, to publish, uh, or if you are discouraged to do so, or less invited to do it, uh, that might have implication for you as well. And again, if we look to the red part, to the red cycle, to the research content aspect, it's very important also, if you manage to introduce sex and gender variables into the research design and research implementation, to communicate about it to uh, 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 use a sex and gender disaggregated data wherever appropriate. And it can happen that the aspect that you covered from this perspective are relevant to the core purpose of the research, in which case they should receive the, uh, uh, the, the due amount of attention in terms of dissemination, which might lead you to publish in different journals which have a gender focus or to uh, uh, tag your research differently for referencing so that people interested in this sex and or gender dimensions can locate it and can react to it because it can actually be one of the innovation or most significant inputs, uh, uh, outputs, sorry, of your research. And indeed there is a broader media and social attention for gender contents, but this applies also to the research community. Um, my experience, which is not uh, statistically uh, relevant, but my experience is that whenever um, um, uh, a research, uh, uh, a gender aspect is covered in research, it's re it receives a great deal of attention, even if it's not core to the research. And there is a statistical uh, data to support that through the evaluation of the uh, European, uh, Horizon, um, sorry, of the Horizon 2020 project evaluation, it was noticed that ha having a strong gender dimension in the research proposal um, was a premium 
for evaluation. If you didn't have a strong gender um, dimension in your proposal, you were not sanctioned, you were not punished for that. You were not like uh, uh, placed down the line. Nevertheless, if you had one, you were receiving on average better evaluation simply because it called the attention of the evaluators, no matter if they are gender specialists or not, they notice something is different there, something which is relevant, something which will trigger uh, a further debate. And remember also that unlike very specific aspect of agricultural STEM astrophysics research, which tells little to a few, um, gender is about everyone. Everyone has one. Everyone has something to tell about it. Reviewers also. Committees uh, in uh, uh, journals as well. So this is something that usually lead to opinions rather than proper statement, but that trigger interest from people. Um, and the condition of interaction in conferences might be different for men and women, but I have no data for that to support it. Uh, that might exist for certain fields. What is sure is that attention is different, as it was said with unconscious bias video. The level of attention is different. The way people are addressed to is different. The way people participate in informal uh, settings around conferences is very much gendered as you know, and this has an impact on the research idea phase, as we know, because this is when the ideas often emerge. When you, when you do train, you provide training in a variety of disciplines, as we do for Gender Equality Academy, as I do on a very regular basis, and you, come from, you go from the one discipline to the other. And uh, what I do usually, this is an introductory uh, training. So I use in this case, um, case studies that were put together in a gender uh, in research toolkit designed by Ella Window for European Commission a few years ago. But when I come uh, to specific settings with people working in the same institution, I take cases from their own institution and I just take them from their website. That's really easy in all type of disciplines. And, and you realize that there is an issue with how we do research, with how we build hypotheses, with how we select variables, all of us, whatever our disciplines and whoever we are, whatever our gender, um, we are extremely selective. Uh, we do not discuss or challenge much our initial ideas. Um, and uh, it ends up that we are able to develop multi-million project on food consumption without uh, asking who gonna prepare or use the food and for what purpose. Uh, agricultural project without asking who is managing water resources or who is owning the land or acceding to credit. Medical imaging systems without considering potential differences in the body mass. We design cars without uh, care, taking care of uh, 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 who is driving it or who is traveling in it. Uh, big data use for uh, the planning uh, transportation system without asking who is taking which transport system, with whom, for what purpose, at what, which hour, basically without asking fundamental questions from scratch. And we do that all the time, actually, because we rely upon the literature, which is gender biased. We rely upon the way we of doing things in our institutions, which are gender biased. And we do not take uh, the time of challenging our own uh, belief or ways of doing things. Um, recently, very recently, a couple of days ago, I was doing, delivering a training for an Irish uh, organization, mixing physicians and people working in Celtic studies. And uh, we uh, had a case study about a Celtic tale, an ancient uh, Irish tale of the 8th century, very famous in Ireland. And uh, someone was dedicating a research to um, the prefatory tales, the tales that were added to the tale. And it was all about taxonomy, words to allocate these tales to a particular period of time and to a particular development of language. And at some point I just realized what the story, what the tale was about. It was about a king and a queen lying in their bed in the evening and comparing their wealth. What did you bring to the household? that land and that land and that cattle and that cattle and that piece of ceramic. 
what did you bring you? And they counted, they counted, and they realized that it was all equal, all but one thing, a magic veal sold, and that was a man, the king having this magic uh, veal of mythological ascendance. And the queen was upset about it, and she wanted the same. So she launched a war across islands that lasted for decades just to get the same veal as the husband. So all the story was about gender issues. All the ways the story was told over centuries to Irish people uh, through education, oral tradition, then through school, then through uh, in the resistance to the uh, uh, colonial rule of Britain, uh, how it shapes the national identity was shaped by gender issues. And it was touched upon a little bit in the 70s in the literature, but not that much. What do I mean by that? I mean, we very often just miss the point, not by asking the gender question. So it's not something around that should be done by an external voluntary advisors uh, who don't, doesn't even know she's involved, but something in many cases crucial to the research design and that will consider considerably improve our capacity to deliver good research. So thank you very much for your contributions, for your uh, engagement and commitment. We